Today we're going to talk about money, so thanks for coming. And uh, it's a little bit uncomfortable, and I think that one of the reasons it's uncomfortable is kind of misperceptions about how the church thinks and deals with money. Um, but I think another reason is is this this thing that I very it's very important to me, and that is when I when I give money or spend money. That's usually how we're talking about it. I, I want to know that. Like I'm getting something valuable in return, or at least worth the amount of money that I put in. Uh, it's like the reason I haven't rented a movie in four years. It's like Netflix is twelve dollars, and they want me to pay seven to rent a movie for a day. Like, come on, are you serious, Apple? Like, there's no way I'm doing this. Uh, and I, I just, I, for me, I, and maybe you're not like this, but. Uh, Price, I mean, I don't have an infinite amount of money, but price is less important than value, right? Like, that's why I love Chipotle. I feel like it's the greatest value for a meal ever, right? Seven dollars, I'm satisfied. It's like a meal and a half. It's a pretty good deal. And when it comes to to giving and the church and uh, the whole financial deal surrounding Christianity, I think that that we've done a, a poor job of, of kind of telling you what the Bible says that you get out of it. It's clear what everybody else might get out of it. Uh, if you want a, a fun thing to do sometime, look up the, the top 10 richest pastors in America. I don't make the list, uh, but some of it is just embarrassing, staggering. There's one out there with a fleet of jets to his name. And... And a lot of times we see that, right? Like, well, I get, people give money to church and, and look, here's the result. It does no good for them. But man, there's some pastors out there worth $100 million. That's incredible. I think we can look and say, well, it pays the bills at my church, you know. I mean, like, that's a good thing. And it, it supports the, the people that are leading in a church. And that's a good thing. But there's a passage of scripture that we're going to look at this morning that, that actually offers like the benefit that a giver gets out of it. It's not the people who receive the money, but the giver actually gets out of giving money to Christian ministries, churches, all of those things. Um, before we look at that passage, let me tell you kind of the two alternatives when it comes to giving in the church and, and sermons that I'm sure are being preached somewhere around the country today. And, and the first is, is simply this, and uh, it's less bad than the second one in my humble opinion, but, but that is the reason that you should give to Christian ministries, the reason that you should give of your own money to support your church is simply obligation or duty. Uh, I've heard this anecdote, I don't know if this is a true story, but uh, it, it lives on and I've heard it multiple times through the years, but of a church where, where they, they passed the offering plate at the end and, and the pastor didn't think that the people had given enough the amount they should give and so they literally locked the doors and said, we're going to pass this again and you guys can leave when, when you've given enough money. And I know, right? It's, it's halfway funny and halfway like, that sounds like it could be true and if it is, it's really terrible. I, we're not going to do that today. Um, but there's this sense of obligation that you need to tithe, you need to give 10% of your money. And if you don't, and, and I, we think that's great, giving 10% of your money to our church is, is a great barometer, a great thing to do. But there's this prevailing mindset that if you don't, then in some ways like you're sinning, that God's going to be mad at you, that you're probably going to lose your job and go broke and everything will go terribly for you financially and you just need to declare bankruptcy right now if you don't put the money in the offering basket when we pass it at the end of our service. This is one kind of prevailing mindset. Like it's, it's evil if you don't give at this level right here. On the complete opposite side of it is what we refer to as, as the prosperity gospel. And in, in my circles, in our church's world, it's, this is a negative thing. But for a lot of people, this is a really positive idea. And the idea is this. If you give money to our church, then God will take care of every need that you have ever had. In fact, if you'll give money to to our ministry and you'll support this thing, then in return, you're going, you're going to have riches too. 
it's pretty clear is that the person getting rich is the person making the statement. But this is like the idea that you see on TV. If you go home and you turn it to channel 20, then you're going to, you're going to see a lot of preachers who are going to talk just like that. Like if you buy their prayer shawl, then, then God is going to bless you tremendously. He's only going to answer your prayers if you buy this thing from them. So give us $100. We'll send you the prayer shawl for free. That's always how they word it. It's kind of a weird deal. Send us money and we'll give you this free gift. That's not so free. And then everything that you ever wanted and dreamed of and hoped for, you will get like the the most beautiful spouse and you'll get the perfect job and you'll be cruising around in the coolest car. This is how giving goes if you, this is how it's going to go if you'll give to our ministry. And so you can see like these kind of polar opposites right like don't give die do give and you'll have the greatest life ever and 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 what's clear I think to those outside the church maybe even to those more than those inside the church is like this feels a little shady right like some of the language that's used around giving I think a lot of people are bothered by looking at rich pastors or even sometimes and I only use this as an example because I've heard this like giant beautiful church buildings and they're like is that that the point of giving is is that fountain or that giant sign or you know whatever it might be is that is that why I'm giving money and if you're outside the church you're just bothered like well, look at all these rich pastors, which, by the way, if you're not a Christian and you haven't been around church, you should know probably that most pastors are pretty much broke. But the ones you see on TV are very wealthy, and, and it gives this negative kind of feeling about giving money to a church or a Christian organization or a, an organization that, that feeds people, you know, all those things. Like, we have this negative, it's, it's probably it's probably not that good if we started peeling back layers. And there's this, like I said, this wonderful passage of scripture in the book of Philippians that says something, I don't know if you'll like it better, but to me it's just so much better and so much more real and it doesn't feel so much like a used car salesman or an infomercial where they're showing you starving kids and you better give or else this kid dies right here, you know, like it's something that that seems just more straightforward to me, just more clear and also shows the value to us. And, and before we get there one more time, it's really important to say this. In this series, we're talking about sacrifice. Today, we're talking about the sacrifice of your money, your hard-earned dollars, right? Uh, but it's important to remember in all of this that we, and I've said this a bunch of times and I have to say it again, we don't sacrifice in order to be forgiven or to earn a relationship with God or to, to feel like we're better people, we sacrifice because we believe as Christians that Jesus gave his life for us. He died for us so that we might have forgiveness of sins, that we might have a relationship with God, that we might have a future in heaven to look forward to. And sometimes people twist that. And especially when it comes to money, I think people twist that. Ask somebody why they're gonna get into heaven and, and it's like, well, I've tried to live a pretty good life and I've given some money. That's a common kind of response, a common type of thinking, and in no way will your money giving ever get you into heaven. It's really important to remember that as we look at this. And then the other thing that's really important is is this. Sacrifice is an act of giving up something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more important or worthy. And the last thing that we saw last week is is if you're a Christian, then you are the place and the people of sacrifice. Like, it's a part of the DNA of Christianity that we would sacrifice as a response to all that God has done for us. And and so, with those things in mind, uh, we're just gonna look at Philippians 4, 14 through 19, and I like just how real Paul is. And, And this is what it says. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles now we'll see in a verse or two that paul's talking about finances so it may not be so clear when you first read it with nothing else around it but he's talking about financial sharing and then this word that he uses for share is that same word that we use in churches today it's a word that often is misunderstood but it's this word that often more frequently is translated fellowship which is a sharing of 
of Christianity together. Like we're in this fight together. We're in this to help each other move forward in our relationship with God, to build God's kingdom, all of those things. And Paul uses a, a, a conjugate of that word. And he says, look, when you gave me money, what you did was in fact sharing, partnering with me in my spiritual efforts. I like that. That's good. This isn't the big great benefit. So if you're like, wait a minute, I've been given money and I want a better benefit than that. Um, but this is, this is important to remember that when you give money to the spread of the gospel, that's at the heart of this, in some ways you are partnering in those efforts. Uh, one of the things that we do at this church is that 10% of the money that comes into our church goes back out into missions. And uh, one of the things that, that we found in our denomination is that, that oftentimes it's easy to forget about the actual partnership because money comes in, money goes out. We don't talk about it that often. It just kind of happens. We believe we're supporting people all over the world that are, that are trying to tell, people other, tell others about Jesus. We support uh, feeding of hungry. We support disaster relief, all of those things. But we sometimes just forget about it. It just kind of happens. And so a couple of years ago, we made a decision to, to lower the, the number that goes to our denomination and missions in our denomination to 9% and give 1% to a couple of uh, women that do mission work. And a couple of them were here, whose names I, I currently can't say because they're in a dangerous place, but they were here a few weeks ago. And it, it's so awesome to hear their stories and to really think about, like, well, you know, in some small way, when I gave money to Creekside, I helped in these efforts. I'm not over in a dangerous country. I'm not doing the work that they're doing, but I am partnering with them. And I would tell you that this couple and the other couple that we support w would, would tell you they would call you partners. They would say that. They appreciate their partners because they realize that they can't do the work that they are doing unless you are giving money to our church. It just, they can't do the work that God's called them to do. And so at the, at the beginning of this, Paul makes very clear that for him, when this church in Philippi gave him money, he didn't just go, cool, I get a pay my bills. He sees it as a partnership in telling others about Jesus and the great things that Jesus has done. Now the other part of this, this really other kind of key word in this passage is that he says that it is good. He's not saying that the money he received is good. He's saying that their act of giving it was good. I think that's important because uh, it can also be translated beautiful and, and, and when it comes to money, especially kind of in our modern world where, where frankly, a pretty high percentage of you, almost all of you who are new to our church, when you give money, you set something up online that automatically comes out either, you know, weekly or bi-weekly or monthly. That's how it goes. And, and so we live in a, in a different world now where, where I think, you know, my parents' generation, especially my grandparents' generation, when they got their cash out on a Sunday morning and put it in the offering plate, it was like, well, there goes some lunch money, you know? And, and, but I know that I'm doing something good. And now it's like, here's my PIN number. I know the church needs help. And we've forgotten a little bit of the importance, the goodness, I think, of providing money for organizations, people that are sharing the gospel, that are presenting the gospel to others. And so in this first verse, I might have taken this first verse, you know, further than, than I should have, but... Two things that are so clear about giving money to the ministry of God, and that's one, it's a partnership deal. I mean, this is you not doing the strict literal work, but being a part of the work of spreading the gospel to people that need to hear it. And it's also something that God sees as really good, really good. Giving is good. And then he continues. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. This, this word 
or this phrase giving and receiving is really interesting, but it, it shows that there's some give and, and take. Like they're giving money to Paul, but at the same time, Paul is ministering to them and he's doing this really hard work. I mean, the guy's being beat up and had rocks thrown at him. He spent time in prison. So he's doing work that they value and he's also ministering to them. He writes this book of Philippians, this whole letter that gets into our Bible to basically say, hey, have, have joy despite your circumstances. And so the, there's a partnership, but the partnership isn't only a one-way partnership. You're actually, if you give money, hopefully getting something back out of it. And man, I mean, this is, this is something that I hope is, is really true at, at our church. Like, I hope that if you're giving money to this church, you also feel like you're receiving a bunch of the things that you need to, to move forward spiritually. And if you're not, frankly, then, then you should go find another church where you are receiving something and where you feel like you're getting something out of your giving. I know it's easy to think that when we give, it should just be all about giving, right? Like, well, I just give and I don't think about what I get in return. But we give to Christian ministries because we value in large part what we are getting in return. Now, this isn't to say it's like a purchase. We'll see that in just a second. Like, here's, Chad had a good sermon today. Like, here's an extra dollar. You know, that would not be a biblical or uh, mindset or even a good mindset, But we do recognize as we put money in the offering plate, as we sign up for it to come out of our bank accounts online, uh, that something is coming back that we really do value. The ministry of the organization that we are giving that money, money to. Uh, There's this other thing that's so important here and and, and that is at the heart of all of this, and I've I've alluded to this, but I wanna make it so clear. At the heart of all of this is that when they participate in his troubles, ultimately what that means for Paul is they are participating in his spreading of the gospel. Um, I can't say that this applies to every organization that's kind of under the banner of, of uh, Christianity. Just because you're a religious nonprofit, this stuff may not apply. But it seems to apply to every organization that is actively trying to spread the gospel. Paul is not a church, let's be clear about that. Paul is a Christian missionary, an apostle. And, and so this isn't just applicable within the church. I, I leave in a, uh, a couple of weeks. I'm going on a vacation. My family's coming with me, but uh, we're going to pl- I'm going to play in a golf tournament that uh, they pay to have pastors come out and play in Coeur d'Alene. It's wonderful. And it's this organization called Convoy of Hope. And uh, I'm so impressed with this organization, not because they pay for me to play golf, although that's a big thumbs up for me, uh, but because of the work they do feeding people around the world. I'm impressed because of how efficiently they do it, but the other thing I'm really impressed about is that they have been unwilling to not include Jesus in all that they do. Uh, I don't remember what country, but they told us this story last year, a, a nation approached them that's pretty cool right and said we have a major hunger problem and kids are struggling to function in our schools because they don't have enough food and and Hal who is the founder of this organization he said look we just told him like okay yeah we'd love to feed these kids but you need to know we're going to tell them about Jesus right there at your public schools and the people just said okay, we don't care what you do, frankly, but just give them food. And and so they went, and they've been preaching the gospel and providing food to these kids in this country. Man, if you'll give money to Convoy of Hope, then this this is something that is good, and it's a partnership with what they're trying to do around the world. And then Paul continues, and he gets to what I think is at least most important for us today, and that's this. Philippians 4, 17 and 18. Uh, no, the next verse is, but listen to Philippians 4, 17 and 18 first. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. So there's this weird thing that I learned about Roman culture at the time in which Paul lived. And that is that thank yous were kind of inappropriate between social equals, friends, and, and kind of socially equal classes. That's strange, right, for us, because we feel like if somebody doesn't say thank you, that then they've wronged us. But, but I guess that the thank you was 
It's kind of like to minimize another person's gift to you, right? Like it was to, I mean, like you wouldn't expected it from them. You know what I mean? Like, I can't believe you did this. Thank you. Like that type of attitude. That's weird for us, but that's kind of the cultural norm. And in, in 17 and 18, Paul is indirectly in a polite way saying, thank you. I have everything that I need in order to meet my needs. Now, this is really key because whenever giving comes up, it feels like maybe there's a financial problem or crisis, right? Uh, a guy named Scott that some of you know, him and his wife, Lindsay, they just moved, uh, but uh, he's in seminary. They went to church here until they moved a few weeks back. Scott has a seminary assignment right now, he posted this online just a couple of days ago, where he... Uh, has to preach a sermon, hypothetical, uh, where the church is struggling financially and he has to give the sermon in order to fix this church financially. And, and, and whenever that comes up, it's a little like, uh, like you're kind of preaching the Bible in a way just to give me money, right? But Paul here just wants to make so clear like, hey, I got your gift I have everything I need. He uses this language like, here's the receipt. I've purchased everything that I need to purchase. I'm not writing you this because I need any more money. I'm writing you this for, for other reasons. And, and I do, I just want to say, uh, because it seems appropriate, that this sermon isn't here this morning because we have any financial crisis or need. Our finances are better at this church than they've been in uh, 12 years or something like that, frankly. So this sermon isn't like a, hey, Chad, the giving was down last month. Can you get up there and preach a sermon? This is about sacrifice, and we're gonna really see that in a second. This is about what you get from the giving that you are already, most of you, doing uh, at our church. And the first thing that Paul says you get out of this, and I don't know if you're gonna like it, but it's really important, is he says, look, when you give, you see it there, it credits your account. That's a big deal. This is like a, a retirement plan, but the retirement is in heaven. And, and I know that it's really, for me anyway, it's difficult to understand heaven and what it looks like. And we think of heaven as this, I mean, it is, it's this perfect place. So what does it mean to have a bigger or smaller retirement account in a perfect place? I don't really understand all of that or know how it all goes together. But I can tell you that if there's more or less in my account in heaven, I want more. I'm just, I don't know, selfish like that or something. Right now, if, if, if I could say to you, hey, here's the deal. We don't know how any of this looks when we get to heaven, but you can have a million dollars in your account or you can have five dollars. What are you picking? You want a million, right? Like you're, you're maybe even hesitant because you're like, I don't know if that's spiritual, but you want a million. I, I mean, Jesus says, like, I'm going to build your house. I'm gonna go build houses is the metaphor that he uses for heaven. And every one of you want a better house, you know, like, don't you? You don't want to get up there and, and Jesus is like, Oof, it's kind of small, I know. You should have done a little more while you were on earth. You don't want that. I know I've alluded to this show every single week, but there is, there is this show called The Good Place that I am now watching. I only started watching it because I used it as a sermon illustration and then I figured, well, I'm going to watch it now. And the whole thing is so pertinent to what we're talking about on Sunday mornings, but it's about this group of people who end up in the good place because they've done good work while they lived. We don't believe it's theologically accurate. And they all get houses that, like their dream house. And I like that idea, frankly. I want a house that's not too difficult to vacuum. That's near the top of my list. I mean, you know, I want the house that I want. And Paul gives us a surefire way to be building our accounts in heaven. And it doesn't sound super spiritual to say it. But what he's saying is that when you give money for the spread of the gospel, in order for more people to hear that Jesus died for their sins and rose again, then it is credited to your account in heaven. It's like putting away retirement money. 
I recently have invested $165 on, an, uh, on, a, on a stock buying app. We had a little bit of extra money after we bought our house. I like the idea of stocks because I like the idea of gambling, and gambling seems like a really bad idea. Um, but it's more socially acceptable to say, like, hey, I lost $100 on the stock market today than on craps, you know? Uh, and um, it's the competitive nature in me. Like, I, I will beat the system. And man, I, I like seeing money go up when I feel like I'm not doing anything. On $165, I get a day where I gain a dollar. I'm like, sweet, I was just doing my regular job and I made a buck. I've lost more than I've gained. But uh, the illustration still is important. And Paul is saying that when you put money into Christian organizations that are fighting, working, striving to spread the gospel then something is taking place in the heavenly realm where money is being set aside for you and hopefully you're gaining interest on it. I don't know if, if you're, I don't know if you are future thinking enough, forward thinking enough for that to matter to you, but I would hope that, that you believe in heaven strongly enough that it would. For Paul, as he looks at this church in Philippi, and by the way, this is a church giving out of, frankly, their their poverty. I mean, this is not a, a rich group of people. This is a group of people who are struggling, it seems. We see that in 2 Corinthians. And they're giving their money. And I'm sure that part of them is they hand over their dollars, right? Like, what am I getting out of this? And it it's not as easy for somebody to say, hey, it's credited to your heavenly account, then, hey, I guarantee God's gonna start giving you everything you want on earth. But it's at least true. It's at least true. And so Paul says, like, hey, I don't need more. And this morning, I'm saying, like, our church doesn't need more. But when you give to our church, somewhere in the heavenly realm, it's like you're putting money into an account probably tax-free too, which is excellent. <laughs> and, then, and then Paul says, what's at the heart of this whole sermon? Philippians 4.18, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Their material gift to Paul functioned as a sacrificial offering to God, that's how one commentary said it. There's two or three phrases, depending on how you read this verse, that, that really just point to sacrifice. And the first one, to me, is the best one because it's something that I can really understand. And it's this phrase, fragrant offering. We've been talking about sacrifice in this series and and I've made clear that in the Old Testament before Jesus came they literally killed animals and in the New Testament they take this language and they apply this language to some of the things that we do as Christians like living a godly life, praying, thanksgiving. We've talked about how acts of love are part of this. But like what's that like for God? You know, I mean, why does that matter? Like what am I actually doing when I do these things and it's a sacrifice because sacrifice is such a a foreign word to us. And then Paul talking about giving gives us this picture that's biblical, it's in the Old Testament and here it is in the New Testament, but it makes total sense to us. He says when you give to the spread of the gospel, It's like a great smell to God. If you were to go back to the Old Testament, you would see this kind of language. In Genesis 8.21, this verse takes place right after the flood, like the giant flood. This guy named Noah is in a boat with a bunch of animals and his family. The floods go down. Noah ends up on a rock, and and then he gets out of it, and he, he sacrifices. And then it says this, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma so interesting I mean God's smelling things like (laughs) what is that but it's something I can connect with and it makes it far more real to me when I think in terms of sacrifice like it's like a good smell to God and 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 here's uh, for me the easiest way to understand this uh 
chocolate chip cookies. And if there was an oven here, I wanted to, to bake these here because it would have really brought the point home. But, oh, they smell good right now. It actually made me hungry. And that's the point right there. You know when you walk into a house with chocolate chip cookies? Even if you're not hungry in any way, even if you've come in, you just had Chipotle, you feel good, you're not at all thinking about food, you're like, wow, that's awesome. It smells like chocolate chip cookies in here. This is what it's like when you make sacrifice for God. He's just pleased with it. I don't think God needs to eat. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't think there's any reason for us to think he's going to take a big bite of the chocolate chip cookie, but, but it makes him happy. It makes him happy. And, and, and what we've been talking about in this series is like, we love God because he first loved us. We believe this incredible thing as Christians we believe that Jesus stepped out of the glorious heavenly realm. He lived on this earth, which we all know is full of problems. I mean, we're talking about finances, and man, just that alone can be so stressful and so difficult. Jesus lived here on earth, watched his parents die. All of these things that we struggle with, he dealt with it. He lived perfectly, though, in the midst of all of it. And at the end of his life, he was brutally tortured, beaten, mocked, and killed. And he paid on a cross for the sins of all of us. And that's what we believe as Christians. And as a response to that, we live our lives saying, God, what pleases you? I want to make you chocolate chip cookies. And what God says here is one of the ways that you can do that is that you can give Money to support the spread of that story that we just, just talked about, the gospel. I alluded to this earlier, but it's so important in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify, this is talking about the church in Philippi. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Saying, look, this church in Philippi, they sacrificed and it pleased God. This isn't about how much money you can give. The, the, the account in heaven is not based on the dollar and cents that you put in. It's based on your willingness to sacrifice, to give us something that's of value to you because you believe that, that the spread of the gospel and the glory of God is more valuable. The other phrase is there, it's, a, it's an acceptable sacrifice, it's pleasing to God. It's all about the sacrifice that you make. And there's this very telling story from the mouth of Jesus that comes to us in Luke 21, 1 through 4. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. What pleases God is the sacrifice we're willing to make, the value that we're giving up because we think that he and his story and what he's done for us and his glory are all more valuable than the other things that we can spend our money on. And, and you can just imagine this poor widow, right? With her two copper coins. She valued the glory of God more than she valued her next meal. And when we think about giving money and sacrifice going together, the question is not how much you have to give. It's how much you are willing to give up because you value God so much. And when you're willing to give up a lot, it's credited to your account in heaven and it comes to God like a chocolate chip cookie and he's just going, I love that. 
I love that. But there's this, there's this, just one more thing. It's probably the one you're going to like the best. I don't think it's the most important, but, but it's probably the one that's easiest con- to connect to. We see here that when we give, it glorifies God. But in Philippians 4, 19, the last verse of our passage, it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. This phrase is literally more like fill you or fill you to the full. God will fill you or fill you to the full if you will give money to the spread of his gospel. Now, a key theme in this book is fruitfulness or progress of the faith. These are two key terms in the book of Philippians. And so there's no question here that this means that, that our giving money is connected to God's provision of the spiritual things that we need. Like, I'm sad, God will help me and give me joy. I'm stressed, God will help me and give me peace. I'm scared, God will calm me down. I, I, I'm, I'm dying, God will give me the hope of heaven. There's no question about that. But, while that's the most important thing, we should want that more than the other thing, the, the question, the argument about this passage is, does that mean that God will provide for all my physical needs too? Let me say that my best guess on st- in studying this passage is that this verse actually means that. The whole thing is centered around finances, right? And so it would be weird for Paul to pivot away from that and all of a sudden just talk about spiritual provision. It seems to me that Paul is saying, if you will provide for the spread of my gospel financially, then I will provide for you financially. That doesn't mean you get everything you want. That doesn't mean that that you get the car of your dreams if you'll give some money to our church. But it does mean that you can trust God to, to meet the needs that you have. Now, there's debate about this. And I don't know. I think it probably means that, but I'm not sure. But here's here's the reality. There's no other promise in scripture that says that if you, if you do anything, then God's going to meet your physical needs. And so me, I'm just going to tell you, I bet on this being a promise for that. Like, I mean, you have no other promise in scripture that says all of your physical needs will be taken care of. You'll be able to pay your bills. But there is the hope that this says that. And so I think you ought to bet on the side of caution here and say, well, if I need to know that God's always going to meet my financial needs, my physical needs, I'll give money to the spread of his gospel. And again, I think that's probably what it's saying here. This is a pretty cool set of things, right? Like, if you will give money to the spread of the gospel, then it's going to be credited to your account in heaven. If you will give money to the spread of the gospel, it will bring adoration to God. He will be pleased with it. And if you will give money to the spread of the gospel, then you can know you will receive everything that you need in order to meet your needs. If you were paying really close attention there, you might have figured out that that spells car. And that's because I preached on this sermon when I was in college and I used, because I was a different kind of preacher then, I used the the acrostic or acronym CAR to say, to help people remember, if you give money to the ministry of God, then you will be credited to your account in heaven, You you will give adoration to God, and you will receive everything to meet your needs. You'll never forget that. And so the, the big, the big question is, how much do you want to do that? There's no huge financial need here right now. We think that you're doing a great job of giving, in fact. But 2 Corinthians 9, 7 is really important. Based on these things, it's a really important verse. And it's something that you need to filter your finances through. There's going to be no guilt trip here and there's going to be no promise of great blessing and all of your riches going up and up and up. But this is something that you need to think through. 2 Corinthians 9 says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
So make up your mind what you're going to give. And when you give, remember that it is a partnership and it's good. And remember that, that it's a way of participating in the spread of the gospel. And remember that, that it puts money in your heavenly account and that God just gets a whiff of it and is so pleased with it. And that it will, it will cause God, it will move God to, to meet all of your needs Ultimately, remember this, giving is a sacrifice that results in grace. Whether it be the spread of grace around the world or God's gracious provision to you, giving is a sacrifice that results in grace. And so the takeaway is this. These are the two things I want from you this morning. One, if you're a person that is giving to our church, and you are right where you think you should be giving, then I want you to be so encouraged that it matters. And it doesn't just matter because it it pays for my children to have food. It matters because, because of these things. But then on the other side of that, if you're a person who's not giving or you've been convicted about giving or you think you might maybe should start giving all of these things, then I want you to really consider giving in these terms like man what should I be giving in order to credit my heavenly account to bring adoration to God and to receive everything that I need to meet my needs if you're giving be encouraged if you're not giving consider giving let me pray that that'll happen Lord Jesus it's a funny topic and uh, money money is this thing that that makes people angry and sometimes crazy and it's one of the great stresses of people's lives at least a pretty high percentage of people's lives and God I I pray that I've approached this in the right way this morning Um, I I wanted this to be encouraging more than anything else God Uh, and, and I hope that it's been received in that way and I do hope that it, God has encouraged people. There's so many people at this church, God, who are so faithful in their giving. And it really does allow for us. It has, God, for, for as long as I've been the pastor, to ask, what does God want us to do? And we're really careful in our spending, God. But every time you've called us to do something, the money's been there. And it's, it's because of many people who have faithfully given through the years, God. And I just asked this morning that they would they would feel good about that. Because I think this passage suggests that you want them to feel good about it. And then I pray, God, for for everybody else. And and, uh, I just ask, God, that that they would consider giving because it would be credited to their account and because they want to please you and because they want that promise that they'll have what they need to meet their needs, whether that's spiritual or physical, God. And Um, I pray that people would be encouraged in what they have given, but also people would be encouraged to give, and not just to this church, God, uh, but to to organizations that, that are spreading your gospel, God. I pray that we would be a church that wants to sacrifice because we love you so much, because we, we are so passionate about what you have done, and we, we, we're just responding to your incredible grace, God. Help us to love you more and more, and I trust, God, that that would result in us giving more and more, God. Not not more and more in the amount of dollars and cents, but more and more in, in how much we are willing to give up, the things that we are willing to give up for you, God. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.